Um, also, I would like to, to thank our sponsors and partners, the North Carolina Biotechnology Center, the Informatics, and the North Carolina Research Campus for all the help and the support that they've been giving to this program. So, I know it's going to be tough for us who are going in the afternoon. We just had a great lunch, and we are right now in a little bit of a food coma, but we'll try to be entertaining, we'll try to keep you interested, and let's move on so we can start and get this, uh, this presentation going. So, for that, I would like to invite my students, Ed Garantano, to join me on stage, because today's afternoon, we're going to be talking about bananas. And yes, uh, bananas is always something so present in our world. You take them in breakfast, you eat them for lunch, you have them as a snack. It's something that we barely think anything about it. But for example, did you know that in the 1800s, bananas in the United States were not really yellow, they were red bananas. And they were so special and so unique that they were sold in thin foil and people used to eat them with little spoons and they would be shared in the family because they were so exotic or so rare. Or did you know also that banana has seeds? And know those tiny little dots that you see on most fruit, but actual real big seeds, which are so hard that if you buy them, you can break your teeth. And that's why these bananas are classified as non edible or also that some of the biggest and tallest banana trees in the world can measure up to 50 feet tall and bananas can be as big as your arm. So this is the world of bananas. Bananas is a vast number of varieties that will have different colors, different shapes, different sizes and smells. One interesting piece of trivia is that most people don't know why artificial banana doesn't taste like natural banana. And the answer is, it's because they are from two different varieties. They are not the same variety. So the artificial flavor that you know comes from a different banana than the one you eat. So this is the vast, the vast world of biodiversity of banana. And what my team is doing uh, I'm with Dr. Massimo Yorizo in this trip through bananas around the world is that there is such a vast information, uh, genetic information that is still not known about bananas that can be used. And the objective of my project will be to tap into this banana biodiversity for more nutritious banana and banana who has natural resistance to different uh, diseases. So to do this, this summer we come with the help of uh, Two of the best students, for me at least, uh, uh, Kendall and Edgar. Kendall attend uh, NC State. Uh, she is doing biology with a minor in psychology and nutrition, while Edgar comes from Johnson C. Smith University and he has a bachelor degree in, uh, in biology with a minor in chemistry. And without further ado, I'll let them explain the project. Hello, good afternoon. Um, the first part, this first project is um, my project. Um, my main project is plant tissue culture propagation of banana. Uh, so what we're doing, the, what we are doing, we are adapting and optimizing a methodology to clonally propagate Cavendish banana, which is the banana that you saw you during lunch. Uh, why we want to do this? Because we do want to propagate this plant. We want to multiply it. And then we want to synchronize the uh, phenological stages, meaning having the same age under the same condition for later use in Sigatoka assays. First, we need plants. We need a bunch of plants. So we start doing gouging. Gouging is a method in which we cut the banana plant, and then we remove the stem, as you can see on picture one. This will enhance the plant to start growing laterally, as you can see on picture B, as indicated in the blue arrows which we later will cut and replant, and the cuts are shown with the red dots. And on picture C, you can see we have a bunch of plants ready to do um, put, um, tissue culture. So tissue culture is, we have four major steps. One, we select the plants, we cut top and bottom, remove the roots, and then they go into a series of cleaning steps. You can see on picture B, 
then the uh, memory stem will be uh, uh, extracted. Uh, that's shown on picture C and D. And then later on, they were put into a media, a specific media. And the cleaning process, and sterilization methods, and the type of media I will explain in a little bit. So the media. Uh, first, like I say, we put this tissue into a media. We wait for about a week. They will develop, they will grow and develop a leaf. After a week, we will take them out, put in a different media, as media number two, that will, uh, they will start develop roots. In about two weeks, when they have leaf and roots and they are stable, we put them into soil. Medium one contains um, BAP, which is a hormone that helps them grow and develop leaves. And media two does not have BAP, so by not having BAP, uh, they will start developing roots. And then um, we go ahead and um, the sterilization methods. Uh, during the summer, we use four different methods, and uh, we change um, a little bit from method to method. It's, it is indicated on the red and blue, as you can see. And it's a series of step of washing, put them into Clorox, and leave them for a certain amount of time. But three out of the four methods, we have um, plants um, that were free from contamination, method two, three, and four. And the best method out of those three is method three, which gives us about 70% success rate. And um, we even set them on fire to see if that will sterilize them, which it does help, but also kill, kill the bacteria, but also kill the tissue. Um, so in conclusion, the, um, we found out that modifying the uh, uh, chlorox concentration and the exposure, meaning the time, it will give us better results. In this case of method three, we have a higher concentration and um, a lower time, it gives us uh, better results. So then the methodology will be adapted for different varieties of, of plant for future research, meaning no, every single method is gonna be the same thing for every single banana variety. They need to be changed a little bit. So, um, so yeah, and, uh, <laughs> And it was pretty good, and I'm poster number seven. If you feel free to come and visit me, and I'm gonna pass now to Ken. All right, good afternoon. Um, as I said, my name is Kendall, and the majority of my effort this summer went towards the total phenolic characterization of selected ban banana cultivars. So basically, to give you a background um, to help you through this presentation, total phenolics are chemical compounds usually created by plants when it's stress, but for most of the non-science community, you're gonna know it as antioxidants. So two major goals of this project, one was to identify varieties of high nutritional content and to use in breeding programs and other experiments that resemble this one. And we also thought it was extremely important with the data that we collected to not only extend this research past just nutrition education, but to extend it more into industry use and other healthcare utilizations. So to give you an overall idea of how our sampling went, we took 32 ex um, accessions from Dole Costa Rica, both peel and pulp, and it was done under two different methods. So the first would be chamber maturation. So A is completely unripe, B is approaching mature, and C is full maturity. And the second way that we did this was also in natural maturity, so we only sampled from a fully mature banana. So with this, I'll move into methods. So basically all of my efforts this summer can be summed up into four basic steps. The first one is grinding. So we took the pulp and the peel of all the accessions that we used, which was 14 out of the 32, and they were grinded under yellow light to protect from sample degradation. And then the second was total phenolics extractions. So there's a different protocol for pulp and peel, but I'm not gonna get into that for your sake. <laughs> Third is plating. Each plate has to be filled um, with water. Then each row either does either a sample or a standard. Then foliant reagent, um, sodium carbonate, and then it's incubated in darkness for about 90 minutes. And then we go into plate reading. So it's read at an absorbency plate weight, um, an absorbency reading of about 765 nanometers, which is what we use to collect our data, which leads me into our results. So as expected, um, the peel had the highest total phenolic content in all 15 that I'm presenting to you today. 
And so this was expected, but it can also be observed that in stage C of the natural maturation project, phenol levels drop in comparison. So chamber maturation, as you can see indicated by the arrows, is just a little bit higher in total phenolic content and compared to a fully mature banana that was well matured naturally. Another term you can see, or that can be observed in some of the accessions, but not all of the bananas, is that the total phenolic content seems to come to a peak or fully peaks somewhere between unripe and fully mature. So this was somewhere between B and C, and that's basically what this means. And um, there's also no significant statistical differences between stages A and B within the peel of um, chamber maturation, but there are some statistical differences observed in genotypes in stage C. But the most important takeaway from this experiment is that the top two total phenolic content accessions are actually Jerry Wyatt and OA511, and this differs because this is actually in the pulp. So Cavendish, probably the banana you've come to know and love, is the one that is most highly consumed, highly produced, and if you can see indicated by the orange bars, the difference in the total phenolic content between the banana that we eat and these two accessions. So we believe this leads to untapped phenolic benefits, especially in the nutrition field. And another way to compare this is that um, strawberries and plums are known to have high um, total phenolic content, but in comparison to the two accessions I've outlined for you today, they actually have, they stand higher in total phenolic content. So the future of this. What I presented to you today, as I said, was about 14 accessions out of 32 that we have in our banana sample library. By the completion of my mentor's project, we hope to have a total nutritional workup done with vitamin C, total phenolics, and sugar. So hopefully we'll be able to do a full nutrition comparison and workup and be able to compare these accessions at different maturity rates. So this is my poster. I love to talk, as you can tell. Please come ask me questions. <laughs> and we'd just like to acknowledge, <coughs> excuse me, everybody that has been a part of this project. We appreciate your effort and the resources you provided to us. Any questions?